Hey everyone, this is Beth. And I'm Jeff. And this is your Enneagram Coach, the podcast. And we're here to help you to understand yourself with astonishing clarity so that you can break free from self-condemnation, fear, and shame by knowing and experiencing the unconditional love, forgiveness, and freedom in Christ. Well, we're on YouTube, so hopefully you're going to head over there, watch this podcast, and make sure if you're there, hit like and subscribe so you don't miss any of our new content. I mean, you guys got to check out YouTube because you're missing out on my beautiful melon. I mean, it's going <laughs> to, it will, it will change of your course, day. Of course, I thought you were going to say my beautiful wife. Oh, but no. well, she's great. I mean, no, but you, everybody you loves Beth. Beautiful and melon. I'm Beth's husband. <laughs> uh, do people even know my name? I, I don't even know anymore. I'm, my kids make a joke that I'm uh, Mike from it's Monsters. Wazowski. I don't know. Is there a woman? I don't, but you I, love a little extra twist in there. I do. I do. That's just how I roll. <laughs> uh, adding else. people. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be talking about type nine and their wings, uh, which are type eight and type one. If the concept of wings is new to you, check out episode 160, where we explain what Enneagram wings are, uh, particularly in detail. And essentially, the wings are just simply the two types that are directly next to your main type. So a nine is not going to have a two wing they're not going to have a six wing, uh, and it's just the two next to it. So I'm a type six, and five and seven are my wings. And since Beth's a nine, well, I, like I just said, eight and one are yep. the wings. So we get to dive into my wings today, which is going to be awesome. And we have two special guests. But before we go there, let's talk about the main type, because we still remain our main type. You're still a nine no matter what. Exactly. So... And that comes with our core motivations, which is the driving force behind your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And your core motivations are the core fear, desire, weakness, and longing. And it's going to see the world in a particular way, interpret it, and then react to it based off of how it views the world. Now, what's interesting is your wings also have core motivations. It sees the world from its vantage point, and it's going to try to influence the main type to think and feel the way it does because it thinks it's right. So today we get to see how our type 1 and our type 8 wing thinks it's right and is trying to influence us as type 9. Well, because we have such a significant relationship with these various connecting types, especially the wings, uh, we're going to be referring to wings as part of us. And we talk a lot about this in our new book, More Than Your Number, so be sure to go check that out because it, it's going to really open your understanding to the various parts of your heart. And maybe that's new to you, even thinking about that there are various parts of you. But here's the uh, clue that it's true is that you're already using this language. Have you ever said something like, well, part of me wants to do this, part of me wants to do that, or part of me feels this way, but part of me feels something exactly the opposite of that? <laughs> right. And so, but the, the key is, is that even though these are parts of you, you're still your main type with all the core motivations that come along with being that type, but we are influenced by these parts that can come from there with their core motivations as well. Mm -hmm. As we talk about type nine's wings with our guest, whom we're going to introduce in just a moment, keep in mind that they're always going to be their main type with those core motivations. Type nine will be leading the way. But what you'll hear today is how in certain situations, relationships, or experiences, their eight wing and their one wing parts are going to start showing up and they influence their behavior both in positive and negative ways. That's healthy and unhealthy ways. Yeah. So before we introduce our guests, let me just paint a picture of us type nines. We are called the peaceful accommodators and we're great mediators. Now, we don't want to get in the mix of the conflict, but we mediate. We like to bring harmony. We want to make sure everyone has a place at the table. Everyone is heard. Um, everyone feels special and important. And we bring a lot of strength in bringing affirmation, encouragement. We inspire others. Uh, we love to go with the flow. Like, everything's going to be fine. Like, it's okay. Um, but also, we're very optimistic. We see things on the positive side. Um, everything's going to work out. That is one of the easiest indicators for me that you're struggling, is that when you start getting pessimistic, I'm like, okay, uh -oh. uh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> that's not Bethy. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, because then, well, and we're not getting into it this episode, but when I moved to that six space, sure. you're like, you can't handle. You, you can't <laughs> handle the truth and all my anxieties. Get out of my neighborhood. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, that's okay. I'll, I'll I, I don't need to go to that flywheel sure. of a mind for yeah. sure. Um, but nines also, what happens is in order to go along, to get along, to create peace mm -hmm. and harmony, 
we tend to merge with others, but by merging with others, thoughts, feelings, and agendas, we lose ourselves in the process. So a lot of times we don't even know what our thoughts are, our opinions are, because we have fallen asleep to ourselves and really have taken on the thoughts and personas of others because it seems easier. So this can cause frustration for ourselves and others because I know for Jeff, like you'll say, hey, what do you want to do tonight? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> what do you want to do? And that can be really frustrating because a lot of people in my life I know really do care about what I would like to do, but I feel like a deer in headlights mm -hmm. and I would rather just go along to get along because I don't want to assert my viewpoint in case it were to cause any kind of friction or tension. No, we, we had a fun conversation. Um, so we're recording this the day after Valentine's. So yeah. uh, Beth and I came home and we had a very meaningful conversation where it was prompted by the movie. And it, how did I phrase it again? Who do you think oh. believes that they... Out of the two of us. Out of the two of us is the least lovable, right. I think is how like, I phrased do it. Do I think I'm the least lovable or do you think you're the least lovable? And it became a fight like, no, 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 you cl you clearly love me less. Yeah, because I was like, no, I know I love you. But as a nine, my thought process is uh, the core lies are I'm not special. I don't matter. My I voice mean, doesn't sounds, matter. You are only loved to the degree that you make me happy. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I think. Like, yes. oh, if you're ha if Jeff's happy, then I've done a great job. That's the thought pattern of the nine. And so I'm convinced, <laughs> well, does that ever happen? And so then I'm convinced, no, I'm the least level wool because we, we are laughing yes. because we know that these are all just head trash, limiting beliefs, false messages yes. that plague us. But, but it, it's a part of the does nine. have an impact on our relationship. It does. For sure. And that's where the nine is sad because – we really operate in the world that our presence, our voice doesn't matter and that others don't really want us to show up. Um, they may say they do, but we're like, ah, oh, we really, we know what's really yeah. going on. And we have to get past that limiting and false belief to give the world what God has created within us, sure. which is um, beauty and a, a perspective that a lot of people don't have. Mm -hmm. So, Let's dive in with uh, the core motivations of the nine. And so you can kind of understand why these are the dynamics we have. So the core fear is that we fear conflict, tension of any kind, discord. We fear being shut out or overlooked and losing connection with others. Really what we're wanting is inner stability and peace of mind. But we struggle with the core weakness of sloth. Now, this isn't a physical laziness. Yes, we like our cozy comforts. But this is an internal slothfulness where we want to remain in an unrealistic and idealistic world mm -hmm. so that we're just experiencing that peace and that harmony. Everything is great, but we shut ourselves out in the process and therefore we don't know our passions, opinions, and wants. But we long, our core longing is to hear your presence matters. Well, our <laughs> guests today are Brandon and Laura. Uh, guys, I thank you so much for being on uh, the podcast with us. Laura, why don't you tell us a little about yourself? Thank you for having me here today. Um, my name is Laura Nekaneki Booth, and I am a licensed marriage and family therapist and certified NEM grab coach. Um, I have been a therapist for over 15 years, and it really kind of came out um, in kind of utilizing the Enneagram in that work. Um, I was just really looking for a tool to dive a little bit deeper mm -hmm. into not only helping my clients, but even like my self reflection and, and kind of trying to understand my own self um, as a therapist and as a in my relationships with others. And so that's really um, a big part of my passion is working with individuals and couples and even businesses. I've, um, I've worked in crisis and um, I used to be a treatment director for a um, residential crisis treatment center. And just even like helping build team development and things like that. So I'm, I really am focused on building deeper relationships. And, um, and I love how the Enneagram um, helps us do kind of all of that, right. um, whether that's personally, professionally, leadership wise, it just kind of encompasses it all. But it's really helped me grow on that level. What do you, yeah. what do you think has been just the top two or three things that the Enneagram has helped in the therapeutic process with the clients that you work with? 
I think honestly, the um, the biggest thing is helping us see all these different parts to ourselves <laughs> and how that makes us a whole person. I think we can oftentimes cut ourselves off um, from various parts of ourselves that are trying to protect us um, in various ways. So I think the Enneagram really gives a good visual and a good descriptor of who we are and why we do what we do. And I think that that seeing those healthy and those unhealthy sides to us um, can really bring in a lot more compassion and vulnerability that I see is oftentimes missing with the people that I work with. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. So Brendan, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. I'm super glad to be here. This is uh, number two yeah. for me on the podcast. Yeah. I'm very glad well, to be back. You know what? Thank you. Um, this is like being a host on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> yeah, where now like how we many have... times can you be on? <laughs> oh, you guys going to start handing out jackets? Ooh. I'd take a jacket <laughs> oh, on no, number I'm five. If I'm a five or why you see Yeti mugs? <laughs> you know, that's why we bought those mugs in the first place was to give away to guests. There you go. And then we just hoarded them for ourselves. And then we decided, no, let's just put them in a storage unit and keep them <laughs> there and pay to for it. Right. <laughs> So, well, I'll, I'll watch the mail to get the yes. mug. Yes, because that's why you're here. You want the merch. I mean, <laughs> the Instagram symbol is such a great icon to put on your clothing. Right. right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so tell us about Absolutely. you, Brandon. Well, um, yeah, I'm uh, also type nine, and uh, I live up in the Northwest, just outside of Seattle, Washington. And I've been a coach for going on six years wow. now but i've known about the enneagram for for many many years it's been a fun thing to uh to learn and and to be able to teach people mm, that's great. i mean having uh studied and been interested in the enneagram for so long how have you seen the conversation and community around the enneagram change over time well i think um when I started to first hear about it it was much more underground i guess if you want to mm -hmm. use that word yeah and then obviously that big bubble that kind of burst, especially in Nashville. Right. I mean, I, as far as I know, I heard it was just absolutely yes. everywhere. Um, but um, the the conversation has begun to change for me, at least with my clients as like, they're, they're coming to me. They used to come to me with like, what is this mm -hmm. thing? And now they're coming to me as like, a, I know that this has been helpful and I've seen this be helpful for friends or family mm -hmm. or coworkers, whatever. And I'd like that to be a part of, you know, my world. And so um, for me specifically, I just, the way that it helps improve communication between partners, between self, uh, is just yeah. been yeah. absolutely amazing. It is interesting you talk about, it, it was a little underground. So for years, Beth and I, for over a decade, we were reading about the Enneagram and we were... I was a pastor mm -hmm. at a local church, and so well, and we, we were. It, there just wasn't any gospel-centered approach to the enneagram, so we took all that time to really assess and also bring language to it that would help those that want to see it and want to use it from that gospel-centered perspective. An actual way to do that. But I, I remember, like many of the authors were not Christian, so they weren't writing books from a biblical worldview. Right. And so we would kind of sneakily go mm -hmm. through borders uh, back into the new age and personalities. <laughs> right. <laughs> sections but now they're... To get a Rizzo and Hudson book or but a now, Helen Palmer. Like, our books are in the Christian right. section. Oh, that's right. We brought, yes, we have. That's right. There you go. How far they've come. How far. <laughs> it is funny to think about how cautious we were. And as the Lord provided opportunities and for us to, I remember distinctly making decisions along the way. Yeah. Um, to change yeah. what and we were reading. It's been about awesome the seeing the ripple effect. That's right. Well, we're super thankful that you're both here. Uh, it's common for people to talk about their dominant wing, which is the wing that they notice the most are showing up in this particular season in life. And many out there believe that they may only have one wing, but that's actually not the case. Uh, just as a bird has both wings, uh, has two wings, so do uh, all the Enneagram types. And it's important uh, to be aware of them because, like I said, we have a relationship with them. And so for the nine, it's the one and the eight. And the one and eight play significant roles in your life. Uh, and you, we're going to talk about what it looks like even for what it looked like in your family 
uh, maybe one of your parents had was uh, the, their main type was one of your wings and you were parented through the lens of that type. There's reasons why these uh, wings exist and understanding them is really going to be helpful as you think about what it means to be you and living in God's world, being made in the image of God to reflect something of him. Yeah. So let's dive into uh, type one, the wing that we have is type one. And type ones, they come with the perspective of being objective, detailed, um, more logical and serious. They're also more emotionally self-controlled. And so what you're going to see when that kind of partners up with a type nine who wants to be, you know, even even Steven or even keeled, you've got, you know, the type one who's trying to button up the emotions and the nine's like, yeah, let's just keep it kind of neutral. So you're going to see a, a type nine that is less emotional and a little bit more withdrawn, a little bit more quiet. Um, but they're also going to bring a kindness to that kind of quietness that they have, even if the one wing is playing a role. Now, one other thing that you'll notice is the motivations of the type nine is a little bit different with that one wing. So the one is all about ethics and morals, procedures, doing it just right, um, making sure that everything is perfect. That is the idea of the type one. But the nine is really fixated and focused on other people, making them happy, their agendas, you know, going along to get along. But the one is really about those ethics and morals. So what you're going to see is the type nine trying to please people perfectly in the way they want to be pleased, in the way that ethics might land on them. So it's just a little bit different than the hard, fast rules of the type one. You're going to see this blend of empathy and compassion that also comes along with that type nine. So uh, let's start with you, Brandon. Uh, how does your healthy part type one bring in that logic, that wisdom, that reasoning, groundedness, but also coupled with that nine that softens it a little bit? How does that show up in your life and where? So I... Um... My staff, so I have a, a company I, I run out here in Northwest, and um, my it like I, I see that come to life in when I have to communicate hard things to staff. Mm -hmm. So um, when when things are done incorrectly or poorly, and they need to be corrected, there is a a way to like there's a tact is a word the word I mm -hmm. love is tact like to have tact and I feel like that is like for me a really great uh, melding of the two mm. of being able to say like you've done this incorrectly here's the way to correct it but also what are you bringing into work this week or today that's taking you off mm. your game because I know you've done it before the correct way those kinds of things instead of coming in with just such a hard line mm -hmm. like oh this is wrong change it right way brandon do you have uh, any reluctance for that towards that part uh, for it to show up oh absolutely yeah what the way i experience it it's almost as if uh it's like you know don't don't make me have to bring out my one <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I really don't want perfectly to do said. <laughs> yes, like ah, perfectly said because I, I don't. Yeah, I mean Beth's that way, and and you what's don't. interesting is, as I've told her, like even if you have to confront one of the team members mm -hmm. or address an issue, we we'll, want we'll to use con confrontational right. language. Don't do that. We just need to have a we conversation, an intentional conversation. conversation. <laughs> like Bethy, you have nothing to worry about because even if it was out of perfectionism or anger it still won't come across that way right it's kind of like it feels like it's going to be this brick i'm throwing at someone and it's and been bubble time, wrapped like, like oh, 10 look, times you know <laughs> it's been bubble wrapped and it has like let's say fur on the outside of that so it's like <laughs> It's the softest brick that's ever been made. <laughs> yes. But but even even when that still comes, I'm like, I'm so sorry. You know, oh, like, oh. Uh. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, Laura, how about you? How does the one part of your heart show up in healthy ways? Um, for me, I see it uh, in healthy ways, more so in, um, I used to struggle a lot with like setting boundaries mm. and right. being able to like set healthy boundaries. And I think the one has been very helpful for me when I'm really he healthy to discern like 
making it okay to like speak up or say something that's right for me, even though it might not be okay for someone else. Um, and know that that's okay, um, to, to do that. And so I really, um, I think that, that I see, um, in my growth path and, you know, in just in my own journey, the one has really, really helped me be able to, you know, know what is right for me and, and stop me even from Mm -hmm. merging with others, um, in that sense and know what, um, what's healthy for me, you know, versus what's healthy for someone else and kind of differentiate from the two. It's interesting to think that if the one's wanting to merge, if the nine is wanting to merge, both wings of the nine, both eight and one, have a much clearer view of what boundaries are. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like God has equipped you with uh, some help (laughs) to establish some boundaries. If we're willing to take the help. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Which can lead us into the unhealthy space of the type one. So, uh, yeah, I'm just uh, out of curiosity. Um, Brandon, which wing do you lean towards more? Eight. Yeah. Definitely. And Laura, um, what about you? I've, I've leaned. I will lean more towards the one wing. Okay. I mean, you can feel I it Wait, that's just that's looking at you both. Yeah. You can feel the vibe <laughs> of... <laughs> it's totally... 100%. This is why you've got to watch this stuff on YouTube yeah. because you literally, you can see it. We interviewed some fives and they're kind of tucked away in their yeah. little space. I mean, it. Yeah. it's just, it, it's so fascinating. It so, I mean, it, it's worth watching real people and not just their voices. So. Well, and I tend to almost merge with every... Enneagram type that we interview. Uh, it's like amazing. my energy is the, like the right way there. she <laughs> describes the types. It, it's yeah, with five and four, you got a little softer with mm-hmm. eight and it, with nines, you're showing up a little brighter. Mm-hmm. How yeah. funny. Yeah, because they get me. <laughs> That's, That's right. right. <laughs> so why don't, why don't you describe Alrighty. a little bit of the unhealthy so one? Here's where the unhealthy part of one can show up uh, in a life of a nine. As we talk about the wing one unhealthy characteristic, because it's important to keep in mind this, that it has positive intent. It has good intent. It is trying its best to resolve the uh, heart ache of the type nine. So the one wing can make you quick to judge, maybe condemn others while justifying yourself based on your high standards, principles, and morals, uh, which can be tough for the nine. There's a lot of ambivalence. Like, I don't want to be judgy, but I feel there's a part of me that is. It can show up in past passive aggressiveness, impatience, judgments, and really exude through your body language. You might experience some internal conflict when upholding your voice and moral principles. And actually, can you go back a little bit? Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. So you'll feel an internal conflict between holding and voicing your moral principles versus needing to main peace, maintain peace and harmony with others. So what, I mean, when I think about it, how it shows up for you, Bethy, is when you might express to me your frustration with something, but you wouldn't for, voice it uh, in frustration to somebody who might change it or who's made the problem. Um, it may be it show up as guilt and shame, particularly towards yourself whenever you didn't make someone happy. I mean, all people have an inner critic, but um, the type one's inner critic is relentless. So when your one wing is unhealthy, you're going to feel the weight of that criticism as a type nine. So Laura, why don't we start with you first? And why don't you share with us, how has this one wing shown up in maybe unhelpful or less healthy ways? I think um, one of the things um, that I see most, and even, you know, when I reflect, I like, I was that kid growing up that could not stand anyone being mad at Mm -hmm. me. And if, and a lot of it had to do with feeling like I did something wrong, like, you know, that right versus wrong. And even if I didn't necessarily do anything wrong, like I would immediately want to apologize for that. So I think the unhealthy one wing comes in me really critically when when something is, you know, like a miss or there's a conflict or a discord or something like that, I automatically think that I have done something wrong and that part in me feels like it and then therefore i'm a bad person kind of a thing i see that coming out in like unhealthy ways and i have to really be conscious of that um so 
even if I do make a mistake or, um, you know, cause some sort of discord, it doesn't make me a bad person, you know, like my (laughs) actions may be a mistake, but that doesn't make me a bad person. So I really see that inner critic coming out loud and clear, kind of pointing fingers, being very critical of myself, you know, um, as a person, Mm -hmm. I guess, and how, I, you know, may have caused someone else's unhappiness yeah. or things like and that. Think, that's where I see it really coming. And that's the point I want to get across. And I'd love to hear, Brandon, if you feel this as well, is that though the one wing is definitely looking at morals and, and ethics and procedures, for me as a nine, it's really about, am I making you happy? So if someone's upset, therefore I've done something wrong. Now, of course, ethics and morals, Mm -hmm. that's important too, but it lands on me more, oh, like I'm being a bad wife or I'm being a bad mom or I'm being a bad Christian, you know, or whatever it is. It lands on me more that way than probably how a type one would think as a pure type one. And then that part of me, that type one, it feels like the inner critic almost has a bat. And like you said, it's more aimed at me. And it's just relentless until I fix the problem. And usually fixing the problem would would mean making someone happy or going along or whatever it is to smooth things out. So again, it's that's why I think wings are so great because we're looking at a blend of the two, mm-hmm. not just the hard, fast rule that how does the one show up only. Uh, yeah, Brendan, tell us first, because I want to come back to something about uh, absorbing or remembering rules. Okay. Okay. But Brennan, how how does your the one wing show up for you in less healthy ways? Um, well, a couple of ways, but I mean to kind of go off of the same point from what Laura was saying was I find um, my indicator is I start to ask a lot of questions, uh, like internal questions of like what kind of person does this or what kind of person says that or well, I mean, these really that's broad really questions, contemptuous. right? Like it it's it's very. Uh, it's just a comparison game right. internally of going like this is not the right way to operate in the world. And so I, those are the kinds of questions. And so when I catch myself in that storyline loop of going, a good person doesn't say these things or a good person doesn't react this way or a good person doesn't care that much when the dishes were supposed to be done mm-hmm. and now they're not when I got home from work. Uh, it's, you know, it's those kind of small indicators where I go like, oh, okay, I need to start paying attention a little bit more here because I'm not in a good Mm -hmm. spot. Yeah. Well, being married to Beth for a few years now, (laughs) what are we at? 28? Seven. seven? Yeah. This is. We're going into 28. Going into 28. Um, Beth remembers the rules, particularly the rules that were handed down by parents or me, society, a, the any, church. church. Basically, like, when he says rules, it's if someone was unhappy or displeased or frustrated. I mean, or anything, someone says that they're displeased with someone else because of what they right. did. It's not even at me. I'm like writing it down in my head. Oh, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to make that mistake. I'm not going to say it that way. <laughs> that will make so, other people uh, upset. Do the two of you resonate with this? A Absolutely. <laughs> 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 like those are the rules and and wow. and the ones you know of course they have a nine wing so they might they might resonate with that somewhat but for them it's really about ethics and morals it's about the inner critic and making the inner critic but, happy but for what's us, it's amazing about making people happy. to me and and mm-hmm. and for those who are have friendships or in marriages have just have friendships and relationships with the type nines one thing you have to remember is that those rules are not there to come after you it's they're to they're applied to themselves Mm -hmm. so if you make a mistake i it there's in some sense there's a sensitivity that i have to be aware of and at times because it you know as nines they they want to portray themselves as kind of weak and vulnerable and be sensitive around them they're actually much more tougher than that and way more stubborn than you could ever imagine um but there because you can take something I say and immediately turn that into a statement about yourself. Oh yeah. And like what Brandon was saying, like who who thinks this way? Who what wife out there has a husband has to say stuff like that to them? 
and it, and it could be like, hey, you just can you put the fork in differently in the dishwasher? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and you're yeah. like, well, my mom used to say this, or dad said this. Well, and... Everything's a rule. Everything is observing people, and you know, like, am how am I showing up? And it's not showing up to get admiration, maybe like a three wood shape shifting. It is how am I showing up to make sure everyone else is happy? Well, and that's what Laura said earlier is if you think of this one part of you as a very young part of you and it with Laura, like when your friends were unhappy, it was the part that motivated you to try to make it right. You wanted to be the good girl. Yeah, to figure out the rules. What are the rules in this friend group that we can get it back on track? Yes. Exactly. It's exhausting. Oh, and we were doing a type f- the Type 5 podcast yesterday. It was fascinating, though, of course, I knew this, but it. one of the guests said, you know, I really don't care what other people think. And I'm just like, I even said, I'm How like, dare can you, you give that? some of that to me? Can you throw it over here, please? <laughs> That's a possibility <laughs> in life to function that uh, way. <laughs> uh, I wish. I it wish. is funny about the rule thing, though, is that I spend my life assuming I am the problem. Yeah, you're taking I'm the responsibility. Too much. Yeah. And when for you to have the audacity <laughs> to think that you're the problem, <laughs> I'm sorry, sweetie. So here's another, we're going to battle about <laughs> who's really the who's problem. Who's really wrong? <laughs> okay, well, let's head into type eight wing. And this is more my yeah, Those are two strong wings. Like yeah. I have five and seven. Seven Big, showing fun. up, happy, fun, five mm-hmm. more. Which but one but and one eight, eight, man, there's some energy there. Exactly. So let's talk about the eight. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the one I, I mean, I use both of them quite a bit. Yeah. Um, whereas like your dad uses them, both of them hardly ever. I'm not ever. even sure he has wings. <laughs> exactly. He's They're more like, like really a penguin. Tiny. Like, like, a, <laughs> like a T-Rex. <laughs> he has them, but he just doesn't use them. Exactly. <laughs> but so for the type eight, and, you know, people can be really surprised. Like, how can a type nine have a type eight wing? Like, how does this even, and hey, we understand, we get it. I'm sure, Brandon, you, you would, having a more dominant eight wing is such a conflict internally. But let me just kind mm-hmm. of describe how the eights are. So the eights are super resourceful. They're driven. They're decisive. They're natural leaders. They champion themselves, but also others, providing protection, plowing a path for others. Um, they see where people really fit in the world, and they have the confidence to ensure that they get in the right seat of the bus and to get them where they need to go. So it's a great asset. They're independent. Um, they struggle with vulnerability and so do nines. And so they're going to be a little bit more pulled back and reserved, cautious, kind of waiting to see, can I trust you? Where, where are you going to take my vulnerability? Um, so that you can kind of, you, they might be very personable, but they may not be as vulnerable. I always talk about how I can be very transparent with the things that I feel comfortable being transparent with, but vulnerability is a whole different ballgame. Vulnerability is like, I don't know what you're going to do with this information. Transparency is like, you know, if you take this information and you hurt me with it, I'm okay with that. But the vulnerability piece, I'm going to hold back. Now, so what I'd love to hear from you guys is how do you see your type eight wing showing up in ways that not only brings you confidence and uh, assurance, but it also brings the ability to plow a path for others because nines are great at this as well. We're, we champion people. We want everyone to have a place at the table to be heard, uh, to be seen, you know, because that's what we fear that we're not being heard or seen. So how does this eight part of your heart show up in these really dynamic, strong, confident ways? Brandon, why don't we go with you first? Um, yeah, it is a definite, definite internal conflict <laughs> of, uh, the back and forth of I want my voice to be heard, but do I really? Um, I I have this story of uh, a staff member that I had to fire. Mm. Um, that was just like the worst, and because they were a friend of oh. mine, and uh, and they just weren't any fun to work around. And they were an eight with a seven seven wings so uh i knew i had a battle or a confrontation coming up for this and i just remember the thought of going like 
this will not end you and you have the strength to to plow through this and do this in a way so like you know during the conversation i'm i'm in tears because like i'm so sorry that this is the case but you have to go kind of a thing and uh i literally i was like had to do my power yes. pose before the meeting <laughs> like i had to get my energy up in order to do it but i had to utilize that in order to do it and i as i'm getting older i'm realizing how much i utilize my eight to to get things done and move things forward because I think if I leaned on that one thing, I would scrutinize, I would try to make sure it's perfect. And so much of it is just like, all right, we're moving now and we're going to figure it out along yeah, the way. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I love the, so what, what was her name that did the power pose Ted talk? Was it Amy something? Anyway. I don't know. I think yeah, so. Yeah. I think it was Amy. I wish I could remember that. So is there night. like a pregame speech that you give yourself? I mean, I want to. Oh, yeah. I want to know more about this. Uh, well, that's like when I before soccer games growing up, I'd listen. Oh, that's right. What did you listen to, Beth? <laughs> well, I forgot the name. Tell of us. LL Cool J. Yeah, but what was the title? Uh. Um, <laughs> it's the one about. Uh, I'm going. Oh gosh, I can't remember the name of it now. Mama said, "Knock you out." Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's Some, the something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would, as a nine, it's like we we are so passive and we don't want to hurt anyone. And so just to get us out of that orbit, I would listen to that song to get me in some kind of assertive orbit, like some sort of confident 100%. orbit. And, and I do that even like when I'm going to go speak. You know, there's there's times where that nine part of my heart's like, does anyone really want to hear what I have to say? And I have to go, wait, I've got eight right here next to me with a lot of confidence and assurance. And I can tap into that energy and get out there and... Whatever happens, happens, and it's okay. You know, I'm just going to be me. And I think that's the good mm -hmm. phrase right there. Whatever happens, happens. Yeah. Yeah. It's like there's this, I'm going to work as hard as I can or do the best that I can, but also ultimately the cards will fall where they may, and I can be okay yeah. with that. Yeah. Well, Laura, Yeah. what about your eight wing? Um, my little eight wing <laughs> likes to say, you're doing fine, Laura, just keep going. You're, d you know, I mean, it is that part of me that does keep me going and keep me yeah, motivated. Yeah. I think it's been a helpful part in me in like, um, I was nodding my head, you know, Beth, when you were talking about presentations, anytime I have to lead a workshop or do a presentation or, um, work with teens, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think my eight wing comes out much more stronger. Um, I've been told, um, in a leadership position, I'm gentle, but firm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I definitely think that that is the eight side of me coming out, um, trying to um, see um, everybody's perspective, everybody's point of view, but still yet have the, um, the challenge of knowing what the end goal is and helping people right. like accomplish that, what we have to accomplish. And so I really see it as a strength in me in kind of in the work that I'm doing, trying to, you know, um, meet with people, kind of see people where they're at. And, um, but more than anything, give me the confidence that I need to show up and be safe. Absolutely. You know, Beth, Beth has a, uh, a picture is actually Adam Breckenridge, our director of coaching gave her as a gift and it's of, uh, an elephant and it's the matriarch leading with the whole clan behind her. Mm -hmm. Is it a clan of elephants? Does anybody know? Herd? A herd of elephants? I think it's a herd oh. of elephants, but... We're going to go with herd. Clan We're going to go with a herd. So Beth know. has a herd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my team... That's so funny. That's going to be the new <laughs> conversation. Beth, Beth and her herd. Yeah. Um, but do you think that portrait that shows this matriarch leading the way... And I, hearing Laura talk about perseverance and even Brandon, that you're going to get through this, mm -hmm. that it's the eight part of your heart that really is that you see that gentle strength in an elephant. Oh, yeah. Like, because you know, nines are so afraid of their anger, which mm -hmm. eights, nines, and ones, that's their, the, the emotion that they all, all three of them actually have common, uh, commonality to. But the nine is just trying to really like suppress it and not even see mm -hmm. it. But it's so important. A, a lot of people think, oh, anger is bad. We're talking about passion. We're talking about this drive within us. And the nine's drive, the nine's passion is 
to not see other people marginalized, harmed, uh, controlled, to be overlooked, like that mm -hmm. really infuriates us. Now, whether we actually do anything with that or if we just sit by the wayside, that kind of depends on the type nine. But a lot of times when I feel that surge of energy inside, I remind myself, no, this is a good thing if I use it correctly. So now, there was that one time that uh, we had talked about it. We, you and I were getting spun out. Yeah. And you we you were up here working. I was. I went upstairs to work to kind of cool down a little bit. And then we, we worked it out really quickly through text message. And I was like, hey, I've got all this energy inside because, you know, I was frustrated. I was upset. And I was like, I, I'm getting clarity in the moment of what I need to get done. So I'm just going to stay up here and knock this out. And he was like, cool. And so for us nines, we lack that inertia to get things moving. And the eight can really mm -hmm. assist and help us. And so it's tapping into the quote unquote anger, but it's really passion or drive or vision that we have. And we're so afraid of tapping into it, but if we'll tap into it, so much good can come from it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we're going to talk uh -oh. about the unhealthy parts. <laughs> we of don't have eight. any unhealthy parts with eight. <laughs> you bring out <laughs> only the best of the eight, right? <laughs> well, remember it does have positive intention. And so it's intended to protect us from harm. It's doing its best and it needs uh, you to see its good intentions in order to bring Christ's grace and healing to it. Mm -hmm. So the eight wing for the nine can make you passive aggressive, irritable, frustrated, or stubborn if you feel overlooked or betrayed. You'll be more controlling and demanding that others listen to you. You'll also struggle to stay tender and patient when others are being disrespected, bullied, or harmed. And you'll avoid vulnerability if you fear that others will take advantage of you and manipulate you into their agendas and desires. Uh, I've often heard it said that type 8s describe a fire in their gut that propels them forward, and whether it's towards something that they are passionate about or angry about. So if you feel this fire, it may be a clue that that's your type 8 wing that's being activated. Um, why don't we start with you, Brandon? How does the 8 wing show up for you in a less healthy way? Uh, I, I notice that the statements in my head are often, um, I'm doing this at all costs, um, where it's just a good indicator for me to go like, I'm, we're moving ahead. And if you're in my way, that's a bummer for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and like, and so th this week I was overlooked. Um, I'm having to move my 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 staff to a different location and i had to meet with the city to like um figure out if, if this was feasible mm -hmm. and uh there's a whole backstory to that that's just a web of mess and dealing with city government mm -hmm. is never usually all that easy or fun right. and just in emails and phone calls that aren't returned that i finally meet with these people face to face and they are acting like everything is peachy keen and I just felt overlooked and I didn't realize it until after I had left the meeting when I was able to sit still and go hey wait a minute and I realized then like I'm going to make this painful for them mm. that was like one of my first <laughs> thoughts <That is> awesome. <laughs> yeah kind of like, the I was like they took advantage of me yeah, absolutely. They took advantage of me and my time and my word. And and now, like, my first thought was, I, I want to make this painful for them. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, man, that that's not a fun thought to have. You know, Brendan, it, it's interesting. And, and I'll speak to just our marriage dynamic as well. Oftentimes, I experience Beth's eight wing. We call her um, Regina. Regina. Um, she can be mm -hmm. either remarkable Regina or raging. And so... Rage, Rage. I, I experienced Regina. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll leave out any of the adjectives for now <laughs> first, but usually there's uh, Victoria, her one wing is right behind it. And what's really behind all of that is this accommodating part um, for Beth. Do you find that like when it takes time for the eight part of you to show up, or does that present to others first as these other processes are happening internally? It definitely takes time. But once 
it shows up, it's very present. Yeah. Um, and my, I know that my language gets less um, cluttered and very much more direct. Right. Yeah. Um, and so in, in, in normal nine speaking patterns, we're, we're very meandering and wandery, but once eight shows up, it's like, do this. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. Period. I, yeah, I, well, actually, Laura, let's hear from you. Oh, no, do we are, did you? No, no. She needs to talk about okay. her. I remember we're, her talking about the equal eight. opportunity here. No. Laura has to I talk about remember. her character defects. I remember too. her talking about her, her, her little <laughs> eight wing, and so I couldn't remember if that was this part or. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so Laura, let's hear from you, and then yeah. I'll divulge all my stuff. Yeah. I was actually saying little eight wing is actually pretty, you know, can be pretty big, <laughs> you know, especially sure. when it's unhealthy. Um, but yeah, I, I see more of my unhealthy eight wing coming out more so in, in like a very stubborn streak. Mm. You know, I just get kind of very firm and set kind of in my ways. And, um, and, and oftentimes I think the struggle is, is like, I internalize that and I don't like it. Like when I, I think that's why it, it takes so long to fester and burn and then kind of like explode, um, you know, maybe sometimes for me, but I find myself like if I'm feeling overlooked or if I'm feeling, um, you know, like someone has wronged me or said something in a certain way, like I immediately just kind of get stubborn and kind of shut down. I can feel that internally in me, that fire. And it, as much as I dislike it, it's written all over my body language. You, you know, I can feel it coming out of my body language, even though I'm kind of tendently, you know, I'm technically shutting down. I'm not necessarily saying anything, but I'm saying a whole lot. Yeah. Without right. Saying anything, right. If that makes sense. Um, and so that's where I can kind of see the unhealthy eight in me come out is kind of really when, um, when I withdraw yeah. and um, and shut down and get really stubborn and that passive aggressive behavior now, comes up. One of the things that we've come to understand and just in our experience in our own therapeutic work, uh, but also with uh, our latest book, More Than Your Number, is that uh, these wings have relationships with one another too. Mm-hmm. So, I, I mean, if you think, Laura, do, how does your one feel about mm-hmm. your eight wing? It does not like it at all. It doesn't think that, I mean, like it doesn't like it when it's unhealthy because it doesn't think that I'm doing something right. Like I, especially like when I know like good communication skills and good healthy communication skills, like it's like, I know I'm doing something that is ineffective in essence. That's the worst. And this <laughs> one wing is like right behind yes. telling me you're doing this wrong. Why, you know, this isn't the right way to communicate. This isn't the right mm-hmm. way to have a healthy relationship or do things. And so then it just, that cycle just goes round and round into, okay, so now I'm spiraling, right? Yeah. Because now I'm bad and, you know, all that other stuff, you know, yes. and you just got to really, really work hard to turn that around and yeah. you know, get back to that true self of yourself. Now, you Brendan, know, it sounds like from your story that your eight wing sort of controls the one, like, I forget you, I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. Yeah, that's it's the stubborn part of like we're just doing this. But Laura, I mean, like it's so well said because my word would be measured for me. Like my one is looking at the eight and going like, you know, you can be more measured, mm-hmm. and you're not. You're letting the the anger that you don't want to take over take over. Right. Yep. Yeah. It's. I mean, what a, there is a the gift of the eight. If if a nine is always accommodating and reading people. And in in the midst of that, being overlooked by others, it is so neat to know that God has given nines a part of them that's willing to stand up for them and to show up and to speak. Yep, that's true. I know for me, you know, this goes really into our EIP, Enneagram Internal Profile, which is what's in our book, More Than Your Number, is how my connecting parts relate to one another. And so what usually happens is, my accommodating part, my type nine accommodating part is always reading everyone. And how do I make everyone happy? And I've worked really hard. I'm actually way more exhausted internally than people realize um, because I can't let up. But then my six part will come in and start thinking about all the relational mishaps that could happen because it's all about relationships and connection. And like, well, what if I do this? Or what if that happens? And so I'm constantly shifting 
And then when I get a sense that someone is unhappy, my three is like, see, you're not good enough. You didn't succeed at this. Great job. You know, now they're frustrated. And then my one will show up and be like, you're not a good wife or you're not a good mom. You're not a good Enneagram coach or you're not, you know, whatever it is. And it starts berating me in that, in that tone. It's more of a curt, nitpicky, critical tone. And then after that, then that happens over and over and over again. This is where you don't even know it's happening, right? I mean, all I said was, would you like a piece of candy? <laughs> I, I'm joking. That's not true. <laughs> but so it could be like, let's say um, when the kids were younger, like I'm trying to make my kids happy, you know, and yeah. we're going to do something fun. And we're going to, you know, I'm trying to think of the best way to do something that causes the least friction, the least whining, you know. And then when, let's say, they would whine or get upset or throw a tantrum, internally, part of me is like, see, you didn't figure this out well enough. You couldn't have made this more peaceable. And then maybe that one comes in and starts to criticize me. But after that happens too much, and let's say the kids were continually whining or upset or the person's upset, then my eight wing shows up. And let me tell you, when she shows up, she's had enough. And she's like protecting me, my my wounded self, from not only those externally from me that are doing whatever, but my internal world. So she's plowing over my six, my three, and my one saying, enough's enough, back off. And then she's also telling everyone else to back off externally. And no one really enjoys that. Yeah, I, I don't <laughs> know if I can remember times when you've told me to back off. <laughs> But you know what I mean? It, it no, comes across in that passive aggressive, yeah, I was, stubborn. I meant that no, I know, suspiciously because like, no, I good know point, exactly <laughs> when you want me to leave you alone. Well, I know. <laughs> but what I think it's good for the listeners to recognize that's, so much more is going that's on. the blend of the nine with the eight is right. that, again, it's like a brick that has a little less bubble wrap around it than the one. It's still like maybe and belt. The, and it's interesting Velvet covered hearing brick. you say that because it's probably the eight that gives the one the permission to be critical of others because you would never want to be critical of others. No, I really hate that. But it would finally be like, no, you need to, you need to bring it. I mean, Brandon felt that, right? I mean, when you were with the city and like, no, yeah. I, I don't want to tell you that you've messed with me. Well, and, and there's a healthy way of showing sure. up and defending or helping others uh, that are marginalized, even ourselves. There's a healthy way of going about that. It's when we we allow our eight to really, and it can be even shut down, right? Our anger can go that direction of, I'm just not going to talk to you. You know, I'm out of here. So it could be that all the way to really nines can blow up and we can have a fit of rage. Um, it happens once in a blue moon, but people don't know what to do with that space. And so I think it's just good for listeners to recognize we are trying so hard and get so exhausted by trying to make everyone happy. And we have to learn that's never possible and that's not our role. And we have to learn how to stop that unhealthy pattern and love others well without accommodating. That's right. Wow. Well, there you go. The inner workings of a nine. Everybody <laughs> thought you were just peaceful and they're, they're, <laughs> you're just... Living in harmony, going with the flow. And we make knew? it look right. easy, but there man, was, there was it's a, a whole, whole thing inside, right? There's a whole. It's it's yes. kind of like going to Chick Fil A. You know, you just you go and you order your chicken sandwich, and you show up on the other side, and oh voila, there's a chicken sandwich. But there's you take a, a peek happening. inside, and you realize, wow, that took a lot of work to get me that order quickly. That's that's the nine. There's right a there. lot of work going and, on. And to at make the end, happy. they always say it's my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Always. Always. Good point. Always. Good point. Oh, man. Well, Laura, how can people find out more about your coaching and uh, what you are able to offer in leadership? Uh, they can find me at infiniteclaritycc.com or at Infinite Clarity on Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn. Oh, Great. fantastic. Thank you, Laura. And Brandon, what about you? I'm over at aimandanchorcoaching.com, and you can also find me Instagram, TikTok, uh, same name. Aim, Aim and Anchor. Anchor. That's yeah. awesome. And you both yeah. are on our network, right? That's right. So go yeah. to myenneagramcoach.com, and you can put in Brandon and Laura's name, and you can find them there as well. 
that would be awesome. So thank you so much. If you really want to learn more about uh, the wings and all of the things associated with the Enneagram, head on over to yourenneagramcoach.com. If you're looking for a coach, head over to myenneagramcoach.com where we've got thousands of coaches around the world that are ready to help. And for those of you who want to bless others by becoming a certified Enneagram coach, our team is waiting to hear from you to help you to accomplish the dreams that you desire to use this understanding of yourself and how to serve other people so that they can experience the same. Yep, and that's at yourenneagramcoach.com forward slash BEC. But as always, the Enneagram reveals your need for Jesus, not your need to work harder. It is the gospel that transforms us. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.